It's episode 13 of the second season of the Exit Philosophy podcast. And if you're watching on youtube.com slash exit philosophy, can you sense it? Can you feel it? Griff and I are actually geographically closer now than we usually are. We are both in Oakville, Ontario, Canada on this Tuesday, April the 2nd of 2024. Griff. Exit, exit philosophy headquarters has changed. It is now Oakville. It has changed. And I'm actually sitting in my parents' basement. So if, again, you're watching on youtube.com slash exit philosophy, you will, uh, in case you doubted it, see with your own eyes that we are a bit of a baseball family. We've got. Uh, I love your baseball background. The well, what's the uh, cross or what's the bat and glove and ball on your over your right shoulder? Yeah, so that that is just actually a there's a thermometer there. So that's just a really decorative mm. overly decorative thermometer. And I can't remember who got my parents this, but that's the Satchel Page quote, avoid running at all costs. And I don't know where I was, Griff, but I remember buying these three photos for my folks and the lighting is going to be problematic, but my dad's hero is was Mickey Mantle. So that's Mickey mid swing. Me too. And then that that second photo is Roger Maris on the left, Yogi Berra in the middle, and Mickey on the right. And then above that is Fenway Park before the Green Monster was green because it was full of advertisements. So I wasn't. Cool photo. Uh, the 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 thermometer next to the bats. Could probably help the is <laughs> hitting, you know, because right now it'd be pretty cold, pretty cool. <laughs> I remember Mickey Mantle when he was uh, at the tail end of his career, but he was always my hero because it's the only game, the only games we could get in Jamaica when I was growing up were uh, World Series games and the Yankees were in the World Series and it was on radio. We didn't have television. And so when I was able to actually see him on the game game of the week on Saturday and Sunday, it was amazing. It was like a revelation. And so there was a radio station in Plattsburgh, New York, that carried the games. And the only place I could get it was in the in the car, on the car radio. So like an idiot 12-year-old, I would go sit in the car with the engine on and the garage closed. How bright was that? All right. So you're lucky to have are your- we are we are we peeling another layer off the young in here of Richard Griffin's life? A little, a little carbon monoxide poisoning in his youth. Uh... Mickey went over four and he killed himself. <laughs> oh, Griff, Griff, what led you to want to be a career baseball writer? I, uh, I cut off my oxygen intake at about eleven or twelve <laughs> years old, and carbon monoxide. <laughs> carbon so monoxide. That's the reason. So catching up with the Blue Jays after the first five games, so once through the rotation, I believe that I said when they headed to Houston that it was a perfect time to face the Astros because they were at the bottom of the rotation and the middle relief for the Astros was struggling because they had replaced three of their best pitchers. How'd that work out? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's the old, uh, if we assume it makes an ass out of you and, and me, and uh, I don't know, maybe there's some sort of ass comment to be made about analysis, too, like the first four letters of that word. It was uh, you. But it it it, it was. What was your so, uh, thought on Blanco? Well, well, well you, just for context, just for context, Griff, right? We're recording on Tuesday, April the 2nd, and you were very kind to push back our recording by 24 hours um because i'm i'm here in oakville for the easter holiday and also i have a a dear friend who's going through a very difficult health time and and so i'm here for uh the foreseeable future and i i needed to be uh with her yesterday i had no idea when i asked you hey can we push this recording back 24 hours that the jays were going to pump us full of content um beyond what was the offering in Tampa Bay? I mean, now we're now we're chewing on a on a Monday night no hitter in Houston. And Blanco, I guess, is a very appropriate last name for Ron L because he Blancoed, he blanked the Blue Jays uh, last night. And a lot a lot comes to mind, Griff. Starting with what did we talk about last week? 
speaking in generalities of this 10 game road trip. You, I thought you said I thought six would be acceptable. Five and five would be great. I said six and four would be uh, something to look for. Five and five would be sort of acceptable. So we both right. said five and five is acceptable. No, you thought that would be great. I thought it would be acceptable. And now there's yeah. two, three, two and three going yeah. to the final five games of the trip. Right. And and I said, I said, you know, four and six, five and five. And it would be nice if it if if the losses weren't ass kickings or they didn't look no hitters like as dead as doornails and what have you. And so it's been an interesting season so far in the first five games and that there has not been a close game. And the scores in Tampa Bay were, I mean, the Jays won by the same score and lost by the same score and all of that stuff. So, uh, but I, I, I think what struck me last night was simply how overwhelmed they were by what Blanco was throwing at them. And we heard about it on the broadcast and, and you and I talked about it off air before we hit the record button, which is that Blanco surprised them by upping in a significant way, the percentage use of his changeup. And he had the blue Jays out in front all night. Now I know there was no Bo Bichette. The next spasms kept him out for a second consecutive game. And that he's, you know, Bo can't come back until those are out of there because as a guy who's had back spasms, back spasms don't feel like a muscle pull. Back spasms are killers. So I can't imagine what a neck spasm or neck spasms feel like. So they're without Bo until those get cleaned out. Hopefully not too much longer, but the lineup was extraordinarily thin. And there's been a lot of discussion about game prep and the coaching reassignments and the this and the that and the other thing. And I just say to myself, you know, there's not a whole lot of history on Blanco because he's a 30-year-old who's really hardly pitched in the big leagues. And now he comes at him with a changeup that he really didn't feature it at all last season, including his appearance against Toronto. Okay, you can sell me on that one time through the lineup. The first three innings, hey, hey guys, like you're talking in the dugout, you're looking at the iPads. Hey, guys, this guy's got a changeup that we, you know, kind of effective pitch, like seems to be leaning on it here. I would have thought second or third time through, we'd have seen some semblance of adjustment. Griff, we didn't, and it's one game, but that's a theme from last year that was thoroughly red flagged yeah normally front office normally i would say that the preparation that is supposed to take place um with the new regime with don mattingly as the offensive coordinator with uh, matt haig with different uh, assignments for hitting coaches normally i would say that that should work except that this guy ronel blanco as you said, came out of nowhere at the end of, on the last day of spring training, they told him uh, that he was going to be in the rotation and pitch fifth against the Blue Jays on Monday. And so they studied, the Blue Jays would have studied very, very studiously. Well, that's a redundancy, but they would have studied footage from uh, last year where he was throwing 49% sliders, uh, fastballs and only 4% change up. It was not one of his main weapons. And now all of a sudden he comes out of the gate and like you, I can understand all of a sudden they're surprised. He's throwing this change up that disappears, throwing a slider just off the plate. And he's throwing a fastball that's hitting the inside corner and the outside corner. He's in command. And the, the option of a third pitch to me would have discombobulated them through the first time through the order and then if the, if he and the catcher make adjustments the second and third time and they have three options that they haven't studied i could see what happened happening i mean there's plenty of over threes on it a nightly basis for every team you link nine of them together and you got yourself a no hitter and this is what happened with blanco uh it's no excuse because once you got to the once you got to Justin Turner in that lineup one two three, with Turner batting third, the next six hitters were toast. There was nothing going on in that part of the batting order, 
And that's something that people suggested would happen. So it, it puts an extra emphasis on Vlad and Bo and Bo with the neck spasms. I believe that the neck spasms occurred when Yenesis uh, Cabrera pushed Caballero and yeah. you could see Bo's head snap back yeah. um, unexpectedly. And I've had that happen when I'm watching my drive sail into the woods, but, but wow. So you've had it happen hundreds of times. Oh yeah, no doubt. I can't turn to my left, <laughs> but uh, which makes it tough to drive, but <laughs> it is uh, yeah, no, it, it's a problem. And it, until they settle in until uh, this new method of preparing for games actually shows something, shows some progress, then I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to be in for no hitters, but against a strange pitcher that they didn't know probably gives them a tougher time than Framber Valdez would in game two of the series. So, so again, we can only talk Griff about the now and we will say and have said in this episode and probably will say again, it's five games. They got no hit last night as we sit here on Tuesday, April the 2nd. We're not going to make too much of a five-game sample. We're certainly not going to make too much of a one-game sample. No hitters happen a lot in baseball now. You've got a list of guys. I know you'll throw some names out who are kind of -of run-of-the-mill pitchers who have thrown no hitters in the last decade or so. But I'm just going to flag this now in case this season goes the way that I think it will go. And I have offered my opinion that this is a mediocre team that will win 85 ish games, which will have it a handful of games over 500 will be life and death to make the playoffs. And if they do, I expect they will be a road wild card team. That's if they get in. And I do think that the offense is an issue. And I've said, look, Vlad's got to be a six to seven win player. He's got to be closer to 2021 Vlad than 2023 Vlad for this team to have a chance. When I see what I saw last night, I think to myself, my God, are we setting ourselves up for a summer of discourse where somebody like Don Mattingly is going to take the blame and be the focal point of enraged fans' attention if stuff like this, I'm not, they're not going to get no hit again probably this season. The percentage likelihood of that is not high. I'm talking about if the offense just simply stumbles and struggles. Are the, are the people in uniform going to wear this because that was the big production feature in the offseason? We're changing titles and we're removing Dave Hudgens and siphoning him off to the complex in Florida. And Don Mattingly is going to be the offensive coordinator and Guillermo uh, Martinez is going to be this a hitting coach. And we're going to have this and the Matt Hag and blah, 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 blah. When really what it comes down to is talent on the roster. And so what you said, and Bo was out, but even with Bo, there's still half a lineup there that to me is pretty barren. And I, I again, five games in, but we're all waiting for the Dalton Vars show that they think they have offensively to show up. And maybe just maybe this is Dalton Vars show. I'm using him as an example. I said a lot there, but it's just, I feel like fall people who don't even play are being set up if this goes awry when again for me it's going to come back to the people who assembled this group if if they're just simply mediocre yeah those questions are already starting on social media and they're not going to go away but that doesn't mean that changes will be made because of that within the front office the front office obviously has belief in what they've done with the offensive part of the game in terms of getting mattingly involved uh, rather than just advising John Schneider on moves on the field. Um, I think that the front office still has a belief, five games, small sample size, as you said. And here's a list before we move on. Here's a list of uh, 11 of the 32 guys who have pitched no hitters, complete game no hitters in the last 11 years. Uh, Henderson Alvarez, Chris Heston, Hisashi Iwakuma, 
Mike Fires. Well, he turned the Astros in, didn't he? Wasn't he the guy? He was. He was. He was the. He 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 was deep throat. And he threw a no hitter for them in 2015. Pre garbage cans. Uh, Mick Silver. Oh, that, right there. That wouldn't have helped. That yeah. wouldn't have mattered anyway because yeah, it was an offensive thing for you. Alec Mills, Spencer Turnbull, Tyler Gilbert, who finished two and seven, finished his career two and seven with the Diamondbacks. Domingo Herman. I watched that game last year on TV. And then he got himself in trouble. Michael Lorenzen and Ronald Blanco. So like anybody who is thinking of picking up Ronald Blanco for their fantasy league team, think twice about that because this list is more likely to be what happens because now he's got video that other teams can study that the Blue Jays weren't able to because last year he was throwing 49% sliders. So let's move yeah, on. And it's a happenstance thing. Like you go back a little further, Griff, uh, Philip Umber, yeah. Umber, but don't pronounce the H. Philip Umber threw a perfect game for the White Sox in Seattle, I think in 2012. Might have been a year or two before that if I'm off. And remember, Armando Galarraga should have had a perfect yeah. game for the Detroit Tigers at Comerica in the late 2000s if uh, Jim Joyce hadn't have botched that out he's call probably, he's uh, probably first base pre, pre-replay. He's probably more celebrated for that than if he had actually thrown the perfect game. Yeah, and Armando Galarraga didn't really have much more of a career after that. Mm-hmm. Philip Humber didn't either. But so I mean, I, it is a crapshoot thing. I, I'm I'm just I, I'm just saying, Griff. Like to me, the issue is personnel. I I don't see. I don't see the lineup. Nothing that has happened in these five games has changed my mind about this lineup. I just think it's kind of a an okay shrug your shoulder lineup. And to your point about the front office having to be all in on it, well, of course the front office has to be because they put this thing together. And 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 so, you know, I I I also have a kind of a sense, and it's not uncommon in sports, but that these guys will be looking to cover their own butts if it doesn't work out. I just, I'm just not ever going to lay this at the feet of Don Mattingly or Matt Haig or John Schneider. This lineup is going to have to improve its performance and outperform at least my expectations for this team to be good this year. Just two points here before we move on. Um, we talked last, we talked about last season's issue of uh, early innings, first inning, no offense, no production, and how Don Mattingly coming in would would help and might change that from studying video and, and being more prepared for what this guy, the adjustments a pitcher might make to them, not always what adjustments they're making to what the guy threw in, in his last start against them. And there's, there's a subtle difference there. Um, but this year in five games, the first time through the lineup, one to nine combined in five games, Seven for 42 with three walks. So a 167 batting average, no extra base hits. And remember in the first two games, the second time through the order, George Springer began with a home run. So, but the first time through the order is telling because it's the same hitters and they clearly were not able to figure it out the first time up and maybe made adjustments, except in the case of this guy who threw a no hitter yesterday. And the right. other thing, the other thing is, in the course of my research, my favorite name of a no hit pitcher is uh, Cannonball Titcomb of the eighteen ninety Rochester Americans, and he threw the game. I think it was at Syracuse. So at Syracuse, yeah, it was Rochester. Right. It was major leagues back then, you know. Amer- I think it was American Association considered major leagues, but Cannonball Titcomb, yep. Cannonball Titcomb, the best name in baseball history. I think he was a utility infielder or something for maybe the Pirates in the 40s or Johnny Dickshot. Yeah, that's 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 the best name I've ever. There's a baseball reference page, but Cannonball Titcomb. If your nickname is Cannonball and your last name is better than your nickname. Congratulations, because Cannonball is a hell of a nickname. I have a feeling he was just throwing slop. Well, um, what do you think, Griff? He, he was he was probably pitching for the sixteenth consecutive day. <laughs> it's like, all right, what do we got next? Just sort of underhanding it, 
underhanding it up there. Well, you, we were talking no hitters off air and uh, oh. you wanted to share that mid eighties story. Was it in St. Louis? Yeah, you, it was of in course, St. You were Louis and doing media relations with the expos at the time. Back in the day, back in the eighties, I think until the early nineties, shortened games by rain that were no hitters were listed in among no hitters. And I remember uh, David Palmer on April 21st, 1984 in St. Louis, second game of a doubleheader. He throws five perfect innings and the rain comes pouring down and they got to wait a couple of hours. So he doesn't want to go in the clubhouse. There's a gurney in the tunnel. So he lies on it. I think the falling rain was soothing to David Palmer. Plus he was thinking about the success he had just had throwing five perfect innings against the Cardinals. And uh, all of a sudden they call the rain, they call a rain out and David Palmer's got a perfect game. So I woke him up. I said, Pomba, Pomba, you threw a perfect game. And I gave him a big hug and his, his, his eyes are all glassy from sleeping. <laughs> and I realized how ludicrous that scene was, especially yeah. in hindsight, especially when they removed it from the record books after they took a Pasquale Perez five inning no hitter, David Palmer. I think the Expos were the kings of shortened no hitters and that Palmer all oh, that Palmer incident always stuck with me. Uh, he saw I did what? Yeah, I did what? Did I at least get the sleep out of my eyes. By the way, you mentioned Pasquale Perez. There's got to be we got to figure out a segment at some point in a future episode for a good Pasquale story or two. Oh, they we could do like a 5 minute segment on that for sure. But not this week. He, They're all bouncing around in my head like him on the mound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, because I remember as a kid just watching him, and uh, you know he had the he had the Jerry curls coming out of the back of his head, oh, yeah. and and the Pasquale pitch was which was the Ephus that he lobbed up there at forty miles an hour, and um, he was like he was a true personality. I don't I don't know if he was ever recognized. You would know better than me because I was so young. But if he was ever recognized around the game for the personality that he was at spring training. And this wouldn't happen with PR guys th these days, but at spring training, he got out of one of his uh, drug rehab assignments and showed up in the clubhouse for a grapefruit league game. And he started the game, got to the plate, lined a single, got bombed for like five runs in an inning, inning and a third. So I turned to the writing group and I said, okay, we're going to hire the hitting coach from the rehab center, but not the pitching coach. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think we'd get away with that now. No, no. Uh, Expo's PR man, Rich Griffin quoted. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, not good for the career. Um, one more thing from the Monday night game C uh, series opener in Houston, Bowden Francis. Yeah. This, this is going to be a, an, a weird comment considering what we saw, which is that Bowden has an issue keeping the ball in the park. And if he had, if he had a flaw in his limited uh, uh, innings last year, it was that same thing. He often looked good. He never really pitched in leverage, but he often did look good. But, but his one maybe, slip up would be would be the long ball and we saw it again last night i'm i'm forgiving of the kyle tucker home run in the first inning griff the two run shot because that's kyle tucker playing to the home ballpark tucker's a hell of a player by the way we all know that but left-handed hitter francis runs one outer half uh kind of edge of the plate uh and tucker just gets on it and and flicks his wrists and stashes it in the crawford boxes that 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 home run is a fly ball out in 28 stadiums it's a home run at minute made and it might be a double at fenway off the green monster but i forgive francis that the other ones you know yiner diaz that that one would not have landed if there wasn't that big massive wall uh all the way up to the roof in in left field in houston he got tonged a couple of times all of that said francis did pitch relatively deep into the game longer than it looked like he would he at least chewed up outs and innings and if he could just simply locate the fastball a little better griff i'm not predicting he's the next dave steve or pat henkin or roy halliday 
but I think there's a I think there's a I think there's a usable pitcher in there. I, I even watching him last night, and the Jays' offense was so unbelievably hopeless. They were out of the game almost right away once Houston started scoring early. But I think there's a I think there's a useful piece in there. I, I don't know if it's an every fifth day starter, but there's there's something in there. Yeah, it's not like the Jays reached into the scrap heap in the minor leagues and said, we need somebody to pitch game five. This is a guy who began his uh, sort of progress to the major leagues in the Dominican Winter League in the winter of 22-23. He had a great winter league season, came to spring training, uh, went to the minor leagues and did well there, came up and in the relief role was really effective at the major league level. And I agree with you. I think that he's got some things to learn. Like every pitch that he missed with was crushed. Every pitch he missed with. And in his post-game interview uh, against the the blue screen, he said something kind of stupid that he was proud of himself because he threw strikes, threw balls in the zone. And, And like the thinking is sometimes it's better to miss seven inches off the plate if you're look if you're aiming at the corner, it's better to miss seven inches off the plate than seven inches on the plate, which is those balls that were tongued for home runs. And and like he walked one and struck out seven. I agree with you. He's got he's got stuff to fill in as a fifth starter, but I don't believe at this point fifth starter on a championship contending team. But it looks like unless Mitch White steps in. Unless Alec Manoa, who was starting Tuesday at the complex and expected to throw three innings uh, against the Dunedin Blue Jays, um, unless somebody else steps in that they're going to go with Bowden Francis and maybe uh, when he's out of the rotation, still have him as a useful piece in long relief. But at this point, I mean, he he was up against a guy throwing a no-hitter. So what can you do? Well, the other thing, he up innings, which was good, but like when he missed it, he missed right center cut and it was gone. The one I think it was the Bregman home run, he, it was 93 and it was a, a you know a good inch, inch and a half in inside, it wasn't on the plate, but Bregman just was able to jump on it. But you know, it's 93 miles an hour, so yeah. you're not you're not zipping him 98, 99 up in there, and he's he's maybe backing off. He was able to jump on it and and pull uh, it. And, yeah. and here's the other thing with Francis too is earlier is, in the game he was throwing 95 96. Yeah. So yes. you know it's probably two seamer that missed an inch off the inside and and Bregman just turned on it. But here's the other thing Griff, you know, we know Yankees uh Yankee Stadium's a bandbox. Well, you got the off day Thursday. He ain't pitching at Yankee Stadium uh, if they're I would, responsible about yeah. this. You 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 use the off day. I would suggest circle guys through. I would suggest that he is because of the off day they will compensate for his spot and maybe go two more guys uh, on their fifth day rather than on their sixth day and keep Francis. And it shows up as the second day of the homestand. I think it's the Mariners, right? The opening home. Yep. yep. I, I, that would be the only way to go about it at this point. And that way you would have them available in middle relief, long relief um, in three days because Lord knows They've been panicking with only 13 pitchers, eight bullpen relievers, and it's four I, games, five games into the season, and they're right. talking about how are we going to preserve our bullpen. What right. crap that is, you know? Well, yeah, and I, it doesn't I help not having – more men. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help not having Romano and Swanson. But, yeah, yeah and yeah, I, know sure. it's a, I know it's an honor. I know it's an honor to throw the home opener. And – you know, Jose Barrios with the off day Thursday, pitching Tuesday in Houston, if you used five guys, would be throwing in Toronto in the home opener. But I, I want I want I want, no, I want if he throws I want Barrios throwing at Yankee Stadium on Sunday. Oh, if you use the off day and push everybody back. Use the off day and have five and starters Bassett pitching in the opener at home would be right. The, and yeah, to me that's, that's to me that is you got a mature pitcher who knows too much about himself in Bassett and is it can can get all the hoopla out of the way and focus on what he needs to do. That's the perfect guy for the opener, home opener. So so five game assessment. And again, uh, maybe I shouldn't, I'm sitting at a bit of a, uh, 
a picnic table style here in my parents' basement, tiny little table, Griff. And every time I bump one of the legs of this thing with my knee, the camera shakes. So if you see like me shaking, it's just that I've accidentally smacked this uh, thing with my with my knee as I, I as I adjust. Uh, offense, defense, pitching five games in again, we're not making too much of a five game sample size, but we've got some stuff we want to talk about at the defense, but you bring up Bassett. Let's, let's just rifle through a couple of things we've seen first turn through the rotation while we're on it. Um, you know, Chris Bassett, um, uh, Chris Bassett's personality that by the way, this is not anything other than a statement and, and take it as a compliment quite frankly it's 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 just what i see it's not a bad thing chris bassett reminds me personality wise of max scherzer like i'm not saying he's max scherzer because scherzer's going to the hall of fame but bassett's got that look in his eyes like you know if you if you take one step toward me i will knock you out you know he's he's got that sort of animalistic warrior mentality he's a thoroughly detailed guy he strikes me as someone who's truly overt in his attempt to master his craft and i think we talked about this a couple of times last season with the pitch com and all that coming into effect maybe he's taking too much on in his starts i thought he had i thought he had gone beyond that in the second half last season where he was uh he was relying more on his catcher to call pitches, but you saw in his first start um, the, against the Rays how he was reaching to his uh, belt and calling his own pitches, and that that combined. I mean, because that's a a lot of uh, stress to be under, and then combine that with the uh, plays not made behind you in the field, and then to me it's like, and I I use this example of. You, you're playing golf and you three putt a green and you go to the next tee and you just try and crush the ball off the tee when yeah. in fact that might not be the best approach and, and become you've lost you got frustrated and you've lost your temper and you can see the emotion the reactions from Chris Bassett um, he doesn't unlike Dave Steve he doesn't throw his teammates under the bus at any time but also, it's funny because I, re I remember last year thinking that maybe Alec Manoa was trying to be too much like Chris Bassett in terms of manipulating the pitch clock, using the maximum seconds that he has, uh, stepping off when he needs uh, uh, some extra time. And in his mind, it's all a jigsaw puzzle that fits into place. But for Alec Manoa, you can't just copy somebody and not have that same instinct for pitching that that Bassett has so to me he should be more like Mark Burley who would not even go to the pitchers meeting before the game he would just say <laughs> to his catcher call your game I'll throw and like you said if I miss my spot it's my fault it's not your fault yeah Burley would he Burley would just say that to the media he's like yeah I I, I don't I don't know what they talk about in there yeah like, I didn't whatever they think once. yeah yeah you know, Navarro or Martin or whoever the catcher was at the time would come out, but just throw the fingers down. And if I don't locate it and it gets hit 460 feet the other way, that's on me, pal. I'm not, I'm not going to get upset at you. And it, Bassett, it, Bassett strikes me as a guy who would like chew on chain link fence, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of that, that warrior mentality. You say Kikuchi and he was, Griffer, Griff, he was scattering. He was scattered. He was all over the place. I always love to try to figure out a way to get a John Gibbons comment into do. the body. He was scattering. He was all over the place. So you say. And my favorite thing about Kikuchi is when I watch him spot his fastball. Just the way his delivery, the, the and I can't describe it because I, uh, on top of being uh, no English expert. I ain't no pitching expert, but neither, that neither. fast, that fastball, when he dots it, Griff, <laughs> that fastball, when he dots, it just feels like it gets on a guy. And I'm picturing that 96 on the black 
with outside a corner yeah, a against movement. against a right-handed hitter. And I'm like, you say there are billions of people on this planet who would give almost anything to have that ability. Just go out there and do it. I feel when he gets into his funks, and this was definitely a thing in Seattle, and it was definitely a thing in year one in Toronto, and we're in year three now, I think he pitches a little afraid or reticent or hesitant. I can't explain it, but it's like, dude, you got the stuff. Just go out and throw the baseball. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, spring training for Kikuchi was a funk. It's one of the start of one of his funks. Those stats didn't count, but he was working on a new pitch that uh, that he wanted to incorporate into his repertoire, and it wasn't working. I mean, he was missing by so much on the outside corner. That same pitch you described that just carves the outside corner. The play was missing by six, seven inches outside, and nobody was offering for it throwing breaking balls in the dirt and nobody was offering it. So he's getting in many, many hitters counts. And after that spring training, he's got not the confidence that he needs moving forward in this situation. The, the, the fact that the Rays in their batting order had nine right-handed hitters, I think that may have affected Kikuchi. And I think the next time, because every other team has two left-handers that they're not going to sit no matter what. Right. And Brandon yep. Lau is the only guy that had a chance of playing against Kikuchi as a left-handed hitter. They sat him. They had nine straight guys that were right-handers. And I think that may have got into his head. And so my suggestion is the next time he's slated to face the Rays, that you put Trevor Richards in as an opener. And if they have to put a couple of left-handed hitters in the lineup to combat the opener, which is Trevor Richards, then they will. And then Kikuchi comes in and faces those guys. Or else if they don't, Trevor Richards just carves a swath through those guys and hands it off in the third inning to Kikuchi. But either way, I think the next time, and that's the only team that works with, that the next time they face the Rays and Kikuchi's schedule, they should have an opener for them. You're, you're hoping Richards carves a, th- a swath. Richards can, but yeah. it can also go the other way, <laughs> you uh, know. But we were, were talking about the home runs Bowden Francis allowed. If nothing else, exit philosophy is full of optimism for the 20. One of one of the meanest things I, I I have said, and this this was a couple of years. I felt bad about it, but I also thought it was kind of half smart. So and witty, I said Trevor Richards went gray young watching himself pitch. Now that that's 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 really mean. But that he has had he has had. He's had years, Griff, where, you know, he's a strikeout machine, too. Yeah. But he and he's had years where he's been very good. But when he gets into trouble, it's 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 the home runs. And I know his big pitch is, of course, the the change up. And that's better against lefties than righties. But I, I get what I get what you're saying. Barrios opening night, Tampa lead off home run. That can go one of two ways. I was thoroughly encouraged. With uh, the way that it went. You know, he he was yeah. he was awesome the rest of the uh, the rest of the night. I think Burrios and Gosman this year are not to be worried about. I think yeah. that Bassett could go either way. He needs the defense to step up and and sort of take that pressure off his giant brain that's always worrying. And then uh, you get Kikuchi who needs to get out of his funk and be Kikuchi from last year. And then you have a fifth starter. But you know, talking about all the criticism of the front office and and Ross Atkins and trades that he makes. How about Trevor Richards and Bowden Francis for Rowdy Tellez? Worked out. That's yep. a pretty good deal. Well, here's another one, Griff. Espinal for Pierce. Like, you know, Santiago Espinal was... The Jays got more out of Santiago Espinal through the years than anybody would have anticipated. You know, yep. so th- these sorts of deals, yeah, I, I you know, tr- Trevor Richards has contributed... About and Francis is up, and I, I don't know. I, I sneaky, I sneaky. I, this is who Bowden Francis is for me now. I, and I don't know why, uh, like, they're not the same pitcher, obviously, but we used to call him Joel Piamps. I guess he's Yoel yeah. Piamps. I used to watch Piamps get worked as a Blue Jays reliever, and yet I'd watch him pitch, and I'm like, I, I don't think he sucks. I think there's something in there. Yeah. 
And then he went to Milwaukee last and year. So I, I, I Bowden yeah. Francis is my new UL Piamps. I never said it about Piamps, so I can't like retroactively take credit. So, so I'm putting it out there about Bowden Francis now that for some reason I think there's more there. He's my Piamps. Don't yeah. give up on him. And, and there are times through the years, I mean, going back in the last decade where the Blue Jays have brought up, where any team has brought up a guy from double A or triple A for one start, and he just got trashed. I, I yeah. think Daniel Norris, who came up and made a start and got sent back down, and then the Jays. Sean Nolan. You remember? Shot. Was it Sean Nolan double who a. didn't get an out? Yeah, he came up from double A. And then there's the kid who uh, came up for a start, got tonged and went to Oakland and became a key part of their bullpen and then to Seattle. And now he's in Graveman. Houston. Kendall Graveman. Yeah. 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 Now yeah. he's on the IL, but still one start does not a career make. It just right. makes it more difficult when social media is out there to yeah. put out every wart that appeared on your uh, pitching, uh, pitching chart. So in, I, I could be off about this, or maybe there is a thing that's out there that I haven't read about that suggests that this is the new way of doing things when receiving a throw at first base. And this is a, a small detail, but I'm a nerd sometimes for this stuff, and I notice things. I forget who it was uh, in the box for Houston, and it's it's not relevant, but it was a chopper to third base in Monday night's game, Isaiah Kiner Falefa charges in, throws and and retires the hitter. Vladdy um is anchored to first base with his left foot, which is a right-handed throwing, left-handed catching first baseman, is the opposite way to do it. Now the throw was perfect, so it's not an issue, but as I watch that play. And I'm thinking there could be a time where a similar play happens in a highly consequential game, and that throw is a little further away such that Vladdy would have to stretch out more for it if that left foot and not the right foot is anchored to first base. Vladdy is going to be limited in his ability to reach across and and snag it or to prevent it going into right field, the throw going into right field, he's going to have to come off the base to knock it down, and then you don't you don't get the out. That It's just a small detail from last night's game, but we have some defense we want to talk about from the first five games. And it just occurred to me, Griff, that, you know, like I – and I've seen him do this before, which is why yeah, I'm he, bringing it up. Here is Vlad's biggest defensive problem that he has not overcome at first base. I mean, he overcame the the – the fact of ranging too far to his right on ground balls instead of letting the second baseman field it. He's got over that. But when you talk about him stretching out with his left leg on the back and his right leg in fair turf, that's the position you take on a bunt or a chopper right in front of the plate to give your catcher more room. But this ball was down the line, and so right. he didn't need to do that. But Vlad's big fault, and clearly he realizes this, is that he tends to stretch – to make his move to the ball too quickly. And if he's got, if he's doing the regular with that throw from Kiner Falefa and he's stretched out for the, for the throw and it's slightly off, it's getting by him. I mean, mm -hmm. it happened, it happened in Tampa when Bo went deep in the hole, the air, the, the game where he made two errors, Bo went in the hole and threw a easily handled one hopper to Vlad, except Vlad had stretched out for the throw and was unable to adjust to a throw just to his right, and he swiped at it, didn't get it. Vlad got, or Bo got credit for the error on a play that Vlad should make and will make as soon as, I, I can't say that as soon as he gets used to the position, he's been there forever, but to me, that is his biggest issue as a first baseman, and it's something that Louis Rivera worked with him on all the time. And the other error by Bo, which everybody is getting on Bo for his fielding. Okay. It's a double play ground ball. Cavins at second waiting for the throw. He leaves the ball in the dirt. He, he catches it at the nadir of the bounce. And he 
picks, he goes back for it, picks it up bare hand. And by this time, Kevin Vizio must know that they're not getting a double play. So right. we teach our kids all the time, make sure of one out. Because you only need 27 in the game. You need three in an inning. Make sure you get one out. So instead of what Kevin should have done is stretch out like a first baseman, which he's played that position. And if he had stretched out towards Bo and made that play, there's an out at second. They get one out. But instead, mm -hmm. he's standing over the base, waiting for the ball to come to him. And knowing he's not getting the guy, he, he turned it and both guys were safe. And the play was bang, bang at second. So a little stretch would have saved bow and error. Uh, Vlad stretching properly would have saved bow and error. And people wouldn't be talking about the old bow. Although Tropicana Field is where he started that all in the uh, wild card series with two errors in what is 2020. Yeah. 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 But, but yeah, yeah. The, the defense, and, and this leads us into what we were going to discuss anyway at this point is the defense. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's been, it's been spotty, right? I mean, George Springer had a, a couple of misplays uh, early on in the Tampa series and, you know, Barrios overcame those. You, you thoroughly detailed. They were up by uh, five, five runs or so. Yeah. Five, I mean, they, it, yeah. I mean, th that's the sort two, of thing that if it happens with, if, yeah, they were the only thing, if it happens in a tie game, yeah. Absolutely. Later in the season, in a game that matters, it's oh my god, I can't believe that they choked or whatever. It's, it's and then in it's the post, opening day, whatever. post game interview, Springer said he owes Barrios a gift. Yeah, For there you go. Yeah, so there'll be a be a Rolex or a motorcycle or, now, or Hazel. Hazel asked if it was a Rolex, and he said no. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Every I guess the Rolex has become almost cliche. Uh, at least a nice steak dinner, um, oh, yeah. something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's going to have to be a calling card for this, this team Griff. And, and yes. again, still a very small sample size, but you expect the outfield defense to be there with Varsho and, and, and Kiermaier getting the majority of their reps in, in left and center respectively. George Springer, um, is still, uh, I think there's a slightly plus arm there in, in right field still. I mean, the range is just going to dissipate with age. Right. And we all understand that. That that's that's common. And they don't and... have a fourth outfielder on the roster, so you got to count on Kevin in right, and maybe uh, Davis Schneider in left as the main backups at those two positions. So I'm not sure what we can expect there. Although Kevin handled right field fairly well last year. And I will say this, you know, and again, when we talk about potentially sore topics or negative-ish topics in a five-game sample size and acknowledge it's a five-game sample size. We also need to do that with positive topics. But, you know, Ernie Clement is putting his hand up and and saying, take notice. I'm I'm here and I'm not messing around. Now, again, Santiago Aspinall was an all-star two years ago because of his first half. And then it went the other way. And then he came back looking like Lou Ferrigno in his prime in 2023 and lost his base his speed on the bases, lost his range at the middle infield positions. And I, I'm still convinced that Santiago putting on too much muscle affected him there and kind of got away from the type of player he is. My point is, Espinal was an all-star two years ago because of his first half. And then it went the other way, and now he's a Cincinnati Red. I'm not saying Ernie Clement is destined to be a 10-year Blue Jay with regular playing time and whatever. But what I am saying in a five-game sample is that he's making them take notice. He's making us take notice. And that is better than the alternative, or the two alternatives, which is us taking notice for bad reasons, or us really not noticing because, meh, he's just there. Yeah. So it's been a good start for him. Ernie Clement has a better arm than Santiago Espinal and has more speed than Santiago Espinal and plays better shortstop. So the, those three things together make him the guy to be on that bench rather than both of them together or – Espinal instead of Ernie Clement. So they made the right decision in keeping Clement and and 
finding a trade. And we don't know what the kid can do that they got uh, from Cincinnati, but we'll see. But yeah, Ernie Clement is could be the a dark horse for uh, bench player, you know, of the year. Well, that's what you want, right? Like what you yeah. what you want is Bo Bo ends up with neck spasms, and Ernie Clement's got to play three or four games in a row, and I feel okay about it. that. That's what you're looking for with a bench player, or you know, a pinch runner late, or I'm I'm good with him defensively in the ninth 10th 11th innings or I, I don't mind him having it at bat if he's come oh, into the game late you know I, that's what you're looking for there's one thing about this opening road trip four days in uh four games in at the trop the three off days before that or two off days before that and not real the the late springtime was spent packing and getting ready for the trip for the for the regular season so when they get back to Rogers Center, I feel like they they've missed a lot of that infield drills. They come out early in the afternoon. They come out at two o'clock, two thirty, and they take infield on one on two knees and and their reactions. This is something that they did all of last year and the year before with Louis Rivera, and I'm assuming they're going to pick up with somebody else doing it. But it's something that they miss. So you know you got to cut them some slack or I do anyway. I think I will cut them some slack in terms of this isn't exactly what you're going to see when they get home and into the season properly. Just blame Mark Shapiro and building those private suites that won't be ready till mid season. The social clubs. Yeah. Now they have a, uh, I'm going to go down there on the fourth on Thursday and check them out. So we'll have a rep full report on the new social clubs uh, that I won't be able to afford uh, next Monday. Griffsthepitch.com. Yeah, you'll have a, you'll, are you going to write about it too? Or are you going to write about it too? Yeah. And, and then we'll talk yeah. about it. Uh, we'll talk about like it. We did with the upper deck clubs. Yeah, there you go. Uh, they, yeah. And the proletariat enjoys those. And I'm included in that, Griff. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I really enjoyed bouncing around to a and few all of the my children. Spots. All my children do, not the soap opera, just my four. I was gonna I was gonna say, are you uh are you a daytime guy uh, or are you talking about your kids? Well uh, um Days of Our Lives is mine. I watch that. Now that really? I don't have to go to an office, yeah. Oh, you're into Days of Our Lives. Yeah. Interesting. That's my well, maybe maybe at youtube.com slash exit philosophy and We'll do some live post games as it suits both of our schedules, but but maybe we could also do a, we could pick a random day where you think a major storyline is is going to culminate, and we could do a days of our lives post game, and I I won't know a thing, but I'll just sit there and ask you questions. All right, so Jordana came out of the coffin after everybody thought she was dead, and. George sold his business and uh, now there's a murder for hire plot. Like this is what we're dealing with, right? On days of our lives. They're dealing drugs from the cafe and we don't know who's in charge of that. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. All right. I That's like that. The basic. Right. Now, now I might, I get, I might end up hooked. You know, <laughs> you, you might make me a, a days of our lives person. Um, offensively Griff. I mean, it's been in, in the five games so far, it's, it's been feast or, Famine, right? Big night on opening night, big night on Sunday against Tampa Bay. Uh, not much punch back in games two and three in Tampa, and then the no hitter on Monday in Houston as we sit here on Tuesday, April the second, ahead of the second game against the Astros. Feast or famine. Um, and again, I'll just come back to my I got I got a lot more questions than answers. I will say that Vladdy's start and you know, you are going to have 0 for 3, 3 strikeout nights. Well, it's typically 0 for 4 when you're hitting in the upper third of the lineup. <laughs> but yeah. last night happened. Um, you're going to have 3 strikeout nights, and Vlad did in Houston. But I thought, you know, his 450-foot home run laser on opening day in Tampa or St. Petersburg, I thought, that I could get used to. That I'm encouraged by. Yeah. He and it physically is, looks great. And he's had some good swings so far. And in the four games in Tampa, he really did not chase at all. You look at his chase percentage and you just watch and you can see that he's not 
uh, chasing those outside breaking balls that he did last year. So that's a great sign until uh, Monday night in the no hitter. And he seemed to be totally discombobulated and not know what was coming, which seemed to be a common problem because they were studying the wrong video of this guy who had added his best pitch in the meantime from the time they saw him last year. So, I mean, let's see what he does against Framber Valdez and then uh, the next game and then in New York. And, um, you know, familiarity breeds bombs usually. And so if he can do that, no. <laughs> o- only in <with> certain <laughs> religions. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I'm that's a blip for me is the uh, the no hitter by some guy. I got to look for his name, Renal Blanco. Um, that's a blip for the entire lineup. But they need Bo back in the lineup. I think they need to. Why would you take the best number nine hitter in baseball uh, in 2023 and move him to the seven hole, and and instead of having Kevin Kiermaier at the bottom of the lineup and having um, uh, Kevin Biggio or whoever plays second base against a right hander against a left hander in that spot in the seventh spot? Why would you do that? Why would you mess with a good thing? And to me, Kiermaier batting ninth. If he gets on base, now he's a guy. He's a guy who can steal a base or go first to third, first to home, second to home. That's the guy who should be batting ninth. And and what they're doing right now is not necessarily working. Although when Bo gets back in and stretches the lineup out a little bit, and uh, Dalton Varsho starts to hit like the guy they w- thought they were trading for. <laughs> are you winning that or are you ifing that? Um, if if you're if you're winning uh, that, no, I'm ifing that because. <laughs> Uh, he had a great spring. He went down and got a and hit a hard ground ball into the outfield for a hit in Tampa, but really hasn't showed a lot of what they're expecting. But he's yeah, going to be out there because they do have a really good outfield with those three guys out there. But well, offensively, yeah, offensively, to me, you can't have him batting fourth or even fifth. Griff, he's a seven hitter. Yeah, he should be. He may be six in this lineup, but in an ideal world, with a guy who's that good defensively in a corner outfield spot and who theoretically would be a center fielder on a lot of teams, because and I do think I do think Dalton Varsho would look a whole lot better as this type of offensive player if he was a center fielder. Because you typically want a little more consistent pop out of your yeah. corner guys. Uh, if he was a seven, eight, or nine hitter and a center fielder for this team, well, kind of like Kiermaier, I guess. But like that, it would look better. Yeah, they need more out of him, but I don't know if it's there. They also need they also need Alejandro Kirk to be the Alejandro Kirk that they saw at spring training. But I have a feeling that when the entire catching workload with Brian Servan as his backup is on his shoulders, that he reacts a little adversely to that. If he turned, if he looked over his shoulder and saw Danny Jansen ready to start the next day, or that they're not asking him to do that extra game per week. I, I would say that, uh, that both Jansen and Kirk are four, three to make up a week four starts, three starts, that sort of thing, but not five or six, which they're asking Kirk to do. So I think that once Jansen is back, Kirk becomes a better hitter, which they need because that lineup right now is not good. No, no. And I I think there are going to be a lot of days like we saw last year where one of them's catching. And, well, maybe there won't be because, I mean, you got Justin Turner, and I don't think you want him at third base a lot. Um, But if if, if it gets desperate offensively, you put Turner into the field, and then you've got both catchers in the lineup. One is a DH, and you you know you're trying to ex- you're trying yeah, to lengthen. There, there, there will be other injuries as the season goes on, but to, yeah. the, to the Jays' bench credit, which is about the only thing they have, is is the versatility of guys that can play the outfield, can play any of the infield positions. A guy who can play a really good shortstop on the bench in Ernie Clement. So like they can handle short term injuries, except at shortstop where Bo. Bo's bat and Vlad's bat need to be in the lineup. I think those are the two positions that they can't really handle an injury at this point. Maybe maybe Springer as well because they're they don't have that outfield depth. Yeah, got to hope that he uh, 
continues to combat father time and and has a decent season while while staying predominantly healthy. Uh, we've hit the hour mark, Griff. So you know we've left some topics on the table, but they're not dated. Um, you and I are fas- fascinated by the Bowen Vlad futures and and when and if negotiations ramp up and the way that opt outs are being used and there's all this internal fighting uh in within the player union right now and scott boris who's never been at fault for anything in his life is upset with union leadership over the bad off season that his clients ended up having when it's probably boris overshooting the mark considerably and not reading the market da 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 so we can touch on all of those things as the uh, year goes along and, yeah, and time permits. There's one other thing for next week because we haven't seen it is after five games, they have not needed a closer and, and the interim closer we've discussed um, could be Chad green, Jimmy Garcia. Yeah. Jimmy who could Jimmy have been, Garcia. I think it's green, but it, I think know. it's Garcia. Well, we can, yeah. I, I'm sure between now and next Monday, they will need their closer. Hopefully for the Jays, they will need their closer. And one of them or both of them will respond in kind because they're both good pitchers. We'll just see. Yep. So they're two and three halfway through the 10 game season starting road trip. As we wrap up uh, recording and filming of, of this episode of the podcast and, you know, we can go three and two. Um, or even two and three in the back half, the five and five, four and six number. I mean, that that four and six little blip that you have in mid-June gets hidden unless you're looking in the last 10 column in the standings. It gets hidden because there's enough wins and losses that have been compiled that you don't really do the 10-game math on it. Four and six is not a problem if they come home with one-eighth of their road schedule for the season completed Against three no, playoff contenders, you know, against three really good teams. You, you, oh, all of a sudden you're a Rays fan, huh? Well, no, I, I mean, <laughs> back to last year, I still don't think they're going to be a 500 team. But... No, I agree with you on that. But yeah, you know, he's a house of horse, Griff. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> something always happens there. Brad Lincoln can't walk the world. <laughs> I think that was 2013 or 2014. That's, that's four gibbies during this show. That's a new yeah. record. Now, John Gibbons has seen yeah, some ghosts. Yeah, we had Gibby on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the house of wars. Um, so, look, you know, we're we're going to continue along with uh, the schedule. Tuesday's an outlier for us, uh, but some things came up necessitating a pushback. Well, we do plan to be here on Monday, and Griff and I will talk, of course, about seeing if we can't sneak in a live post game on YouTube.com slash Exit Philosophy. I thought the uh, Easter Monday was a good day to push us back, and hopefully their bats can be resurrected in three days or less. I uh, I, I wanted to let that breathe for a moment <laughs> because I because it was too good. I didn't know where you were going with it. I, I was going to jump in and say what I said earlier, which is I'm glad we pushed it back 24 hours because it gave us a no-hitter against the Jays to chew on. Good content, good content, but I can't top that line. So it's, it's best we leave it there. So again, Griff's the pitch.com to get all of Griff's writing and an episode of the exit philosophy podcast. We link the, or Griff links the video of this podcast to Griff's the pitch.com. Get on there, subscribe, uh, throw him a little cash. He'll love you for it. And you'll get all of his content throughout the course of the year, not just the season, uh, but the, the 12 month year and youtube.com slash exit philosophy is where you can, see us in podcast form and join us for selected uh, post-game lives that we will do uh, over the course of the season. So we thank you for listening and the Jays will be on the verge of the home opener when we uh, join you again for the next episode of Exit Philosophy. Thanks, Scotty Mac. Thanks everyone for listening.